Devin Pike with the Dallas International Film Festival. And as a baseball nut, I've been looking forward to seeing the documentary No No about Doc Ellis for a while now. And when it was announced as part of the lineup here at Diff, I was ecstatic. And I've been railing to people if you don't. I mean, if all you think of is the one bullet point on Doc Ellis' life, you're not paying attention to the rest of the doc. Mike Blizzard is here. He's one of the producers on the documentary. First off, Mike, thanks for bringing this film to Dallas and not making me have to wait through lines at South by Southwest to go see it, first off. We're very happy to be in Dallas. This is actually the first place that we've played where we also shot the film. The last interviews we did for the film were a little bit less than a year ago uh, here in the Dallas area because Doc had you know, a time where he was playing for the Rangers in the late 70s and so we were able to interview Jim Sundberg who's now VP of the Texas Rangers. He was the catcher uh, for Doc. Uh, Doc's second wife, Austin. Um, Brad Corbett Jr. who's the son of the um, uh, owner at that time of the Rangers, Brad Corbett. And uh, Jim Revo Reeves who's a longtime sports columnist and was a beat reporter for the Rangers back then. That, that time with the Rangers is just insane in and of itself. If you've read the book Seasons Hell by Mike Shropshire, yes. that whole period of the Rangers was just turmoil. But Doc seemed to fit really well into that clubhouse because he was a maelstrom in and of himself at that point. Yeah, there. I mean, uh, Randy Galloway, who's uh, uh, also a great columnist and reporter here in uh, Dallas, had told the story that... Uh, one night and a fellow reporter came to him and said, did you hear the story about Doc and Fergie and these guys? They stayed, uh, after the bar closed, they stayed in till 4 a.m. drinking. And Randy said, not only did I hear the story, but I was there. Um, and it was just a very different time when the players mixed with the public more, they mixed with reporters more, and, um, and they lived a pretty wild lifestyle at the same time. You look at, at stories from uh, Mickey Mantle f uh, for the early or for the late fifties and early sixties, and all of that Yankee culture with the swirl of reporters around them, and then this you know all the stories of the seventies Dallas Cowboys and the seventies Texas Rangers. You don't see that kind of insanity these days because all of media seems to be so immediate. Everybody has an HD camera in their phone as they're walking around with them. Do you think Doc could have gotten away with half the stuff that he did in his career had it been in the 21st century where everybody had access to that kind of media? It's so different that it's even almost impossible to imagine. I mean, if you think about just the way that the players today are much more sort of their own brand they're much more controlled. Um, the, the reporters don't have the sort of access that they used to have. To, they're not out drinking with the, you know, the beat reporters uh, late at night. They've, you know, they make so much more money now than Doc Ellis ever did. As Brad Corbett Jr. said about Doc, he said, back then the, the players made just enough money to get themselves in trouble. <laughs> but they didn't make money to, you know, he, when he left the Rangers, he got a job. You know, he wasn't able to retire on the income he had made as a baseball player. And he had got a job here in Dallas working for Corbin Industries um, and later became a drug counselor. Um, I mean, he was a working person because it was just, you know, maybe he was making $80,000 a year, $250,000 a year at most. Um, and so I think today there's just a real disconnect, uh, uh, partly because of, like the privacy issues you mentioned. But also just in that, you know, players are making multi-million dollar salaries and that creates a very different dynamic. How did you get involved with the project? I met the director, Jeffrey Radice, uh, through some mutual friends and he had uh, in his studio a wall of Doc Ellis. He had all these great news clippings and stories about it and I said, I remember this story and I'd always remembered it as Doc Ellis throwing a perfect game. Uh, on LSD, and, and the reality is it was far from perfect. You know, he hit several batters, he walked eight, um, but, uh, and he played me some audio. And that audio later became the background audio for a short called Doc Ellis and the LSD No-No that's on YouTube. It played uh, the Dallas Film Festival a few years ago and uh, has like four and a half million hits on YouTube. And um, I, this was before the short had come out, and I was just so blown away by that audio because Doc's personality came through in such a way. I knew it was a project I had to be involved in. 
Were you surprised that Doc was as forthcoming on his escapades through his career? And you know, because I've heard interviews with him before that weren't associated with the documentary, and he's very forthright with it. And he'll he'll say flat out, "This is where I screwed up. This is what we did," because this was the reality of who we were in Major League Baseball at the time. Um, that's part of the recovery process. Uh, is that you're supposed to admit what you have done and talk openly about what you've done. Um, in his later career as a drug counselor, you know, I think that's what made him very effective. Because if you're talking to someone who has problems, they have to be able to relate to you. You're going to have to talk about what you went through and talk very openly and honestly. Um, you can't, as we have uh, someone in the film saying, you can't BS uh, these kids. Um, and that's what made Doc very effective. And, you know, it's part of the theory of the movie is that that's why he came out and started talking about the LSD no-hitter. He had told people privately about it uh, previously. There was a book written about him in 1976 called In the Country of Baseball by Donald Hall, who later became U.S. Poet Laureate. And it's really funny because how many sports players have their, you know, biography written by someone who becomes Poet Laureate. Uh, that's the kind of guy Doc was. But um, we have uh, collected pieces of the book and the original manuscript and can show how much of the content was edited and excised um, based on concerns about what was in there, about the LSD, about cocaine use, amphetamine use, um, because in that era Doc was still playing baseball and he could have easily been blackballed if some of that stuff had come out. But after he retired from baseball, he got sober, he started talking much more openly about what he'd been through. Did Major League Baseball give you any concerns with the way that the brand was being portrayed, even though this was you know, 40 years ago? We have, um, I'll say this, we've had great support from many of the, the teams and organizations, including the Texas Rangers. And we shot Jim Sundberg in the president's office at the Ranger Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, they were very helpful. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Houston Astros, we've shot at all those ballparks. And all those teams have been very open and helpful. Um, our only interaction with Major League Baseball itself was somewhat negative. We were trying to shoot at uh, uh, the Dodger Stadium in LA and they were in bankruptcy at the time. And uh, so we had to go up through the chain of Major League Baseball to get approval to shoot there. We'd never had a problem before. And suddenly we faced all these questions. Well, can you send us the script? Can you, you know, <laughs> we need to pre-approve this. And so finally we said, well, we're just not going to shoot there, you know. We're not ready to, um, we don't have a script, it's a documentary, we don't, you know. Um, but since then, you know, they've tweeted about the film on, you know, the MLB uh, Twitter account. Um, we've run into no issues or problems. I think that it is, you know, you have a book like Ball Four came out, you know, how many years ago now? Forty some years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, that talked openly about amphetamine use and many of these stars taking it. It's, it's a known thing. Um, I don't think it's something that Major League Baseball wants to talk about, but I, don't, I also don't think it's the sort of thing they're going to actively try to stop people from talking about, seemingly so. When you when you watch the film, and I, it's again, it, it's 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 catnip for somebody like me who just wants to know more about the that era of baseball because it was when I was starting to watch it as a kid. There's there, there there's all these behind the scenes stories and you just wish you could have been a fly on the wall for that. Was there one story in particular, even though you knew a lot of the narrative going in to production, was there one story that you just said, man, I had no idea I was going to hear that? There's so many, really. I mean, um, uh, there were so many surprises in the film. I guess the one thing I don't think we knew coming into the film was Doc meeting Muhammad Ali. And when Muhammad Ali came into the locker room and Doc ended up shadow boxing uh, with him, uh, it's definitely a story. We've, we've used animation techniques because, we're, of course, we don't have any footage of Muhammad Ali visiting uh, the locker room. But um, for the pirates who were in that era, that was consistently, if we said, what's your favorite Doc story? They said, it was when Muhammad Ali came to the locker room and Doc boxed him in the locker room. And uh, so we knew we had to do something very special uh, with that story. But, you know, in the documentary process, many of the stories that people told were reveals to us. You know, when his uh, second wife, Austin, talks about 
the harrowing instant incident that they had, you know, this terrible domestic violence incident in the film. We didn't know she was going to tell that. We didn't know the details of that. We were surprised as anyone. And now it's the, the actually, it's the sort of longest uninterrupted section of someone talking in the entire film when she tells that story. She's going to come out to the screening today uh, at 4 p.m. And, um, and she was also, when she showed up for her interview, she brought a box of Super 8 reels that now are incorporated into the film. We didn't know she had those. She just said, you know, could this be useful? I don't even know what's on some of them. She didn't have any way to project them anymore. Right. Um, and when we were able to look at that, I mean, it was just, it was uh, uh, golden to have that opportunity to have sort of behind the scenes, family footage, footage of spring training, um, him, you know, just joking around with these other players. And to be honest, it also saved us a lot of money to be able to license that from her rather than to have, a, have to use a lot of stock footage, um, which can get really expensive in the documentary process. What are the plans for the documentary once it gets out of the festival circuit? Yeah, we go to a couple more festivals and then we're in negotiations with, you know, a variety of distributors and cable networks that are interested in the film. We want to find the right spot for it and the right way to, to be honest, for the most people possible to see the film mm -hmm. because, you know, it's not our story. Um, it's his story and he spent the last, you know, portion of his life, you know, attempting to tell his story to people to make a difference. And so we definitely feel a responsibility to get this film seen uh, by as many people as possible. And we want to do things like, you know, show it in correctional facilities show it to at-risk youth as well and the response from those folks we had some people at the screening last night who came up afterwards and shared their stories and how could they get it to their group um, because while some people might you know the content is is a little bit you know controversial I guess at times for people who are going through that that's what makes it work for them to see this guy you know going through that process and then turning his life around you can find out more information about Nono and all the films here at the festival at DallasFilm.org. Mike, again, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for bringing this film out to us. Thank really you. Great it. to be in Dallas. You bet.